talking about uh, yesterday, so and I want to go beyond the techniques that uh, we introduced yesterday. But just as a brief recap, so you get it as a, as a bonus for being on time. Um, actually, just one sec. Something is going. Sorry? No, yeah, maybe that, no, no, I have a, something is weird with the slide, so let me just take, okay, good. Um, so what we were looking at, we were looking at this general problem of we're giving two interactive systems and we have a distinguisher, the distinguisher interact with either of the two and then the interaction generates a transcript and then we formalize the distinguishing advantage of a distinguisher making Q queries uh, as the statistical or total variation distance of the two transcripts. And then we have uh, studied uh, this, this quantity and introduced a method which in particular was relying on considering these interpolation uh, probabilities that uh, some of you have asked me question afterwards how to really interpret them. So it's good to have the right picture in mind. So what they really mean is that we have some fixed interaction and the way you should think about it is imagine that we decide just a priori to feed these inputs one by one, x1 to xq to the system, and then uh, we want to see what's the probability that the system will behave consistently with this transfer. So given these queries, we'll return the corresponding outputs y1 to yq. And that's kind of a property of the system, so independently of what the distinguisher actually does. In fact, this, this interpolation probability is defined the system, so you could rederive the original uh, probabilities out of them, so you can think about that a little bit. And, um, and so uh, we want to uh, use this uh, to now, a property of these probabilities, to derive uh, some bound on the indistinguishability for a particular distinguisher. And the method we've been working with uh, at the end of yesterday's uh, class was this H coefficient method, which was originally due to Pateran. Uh, and the basic idea there was to partition the set of good the transcripts into good and bad ones and then prove that for the good ones uh, their ratio behaves nicely meaning that for any good transcript tau the ratio of the probabilities of the interpolation prob probabilities the, the probability of f over the one for g is at most one minus epsilon or respect or equivalently one minus the ratio is at most epsilon and then we have seen that there might be transcripts for which this property is not true, and uh, these are the bad ones. But what we show is that for the second system that we consider, the probability that the distinguisher manages to create such a bad transcript in an interaction with G is bounded by some other small number delta. And then when we are given such epsilon and delta, we can immediately derive that the distinguishing advantage is almost epsilon plus delta. And we had used this in one example to uh, prove security of the even Mansour construction in a rather uh, easy way compared to prior proofs that were not using this method. So today, what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to mostly show you examples where this technique, uh, or this general idea of partitioning things into good and bad actually uh, fails. And, and this goes back to two significant open questions uh, in symmetric crypto, at least for those of us who have worked on it, these were sort of like benchmark questions in terms of testing your methods and see uh, how easily you will get approved. And um, they, they, they led to two techniques that I, I'm going to present. One is the expectation method, the other one is the chi-square method that um, have led to either giving tight bounds or significant simplifications over uh, other works in this space. So let me start with the first one, uh, the expectation method. And what we are going to study as our motivating problem is uh, this generalized version of the even Mansour construction that we studied yesterday. So remember that the basic even Mansour construction, the idea was that it's a block cipher and when you encrypt a particular message or block M, what you do is EXOR part of the key, so say the first half of the key, then apply a permutation and then XOR the second half of the key, and then you get the final output. So what we want to do now is we want to iterate this construction over more rounds, say R rounds, and at each round, at least for the analysis today, and I'll tell you a little bit more about, uh, maybe at the end, about uh, avoiding this, 
But for today, we're going to uh, assume that these permutations are random permutations, like in the case of the even Mansour construction, but they're also going to be independent. Uh, so independent uh, pi 1 to um, pi r. And we want to prove now same thing that we've done yesterday. So we have an adversary that can query these permutations or the overall construction under uh, this long key. So which is made of all uh, keys k0 to kr. And so the adversary can query either the overall construction or a random permutation plus this uh, independent r permutation. So we want to um, assess security. So again, yesterday we proved the theorem for the case of r equal 1. That's a special case. And we use the h coefficient method. And um, the question of generalizing this to multiple rounds was actually open for a long while. And by open, I mean mostly in terms of assessing the exact um, concrete security. So I think that, so the first paper dealing with this was in 2012 and they proved, now it's not important that you parse this and we'll come back to some of these things later, but they prove a rather complex bound on distinguishing this construction from a random permutation. And then uh, things went over until the current state of the art, which is actually basically the exact bound, I mean, in some sense, at least uh, given the framework we are using to prove this, was a work of myself with uh, Viet Tung Hong. Um, but, but prior to that, there were some interesting bounds that were using all sorts of different techniques. So there was an initial work that was using uh, special information theoretic distance metrics, in particular Hellinger distance uh, by John Steinberger. Then some, some, some later work uh, by, uh, I think this was Lampen, uh, Paterin and Sorin, was using Markov chain techniques and then there was some later work by, by Cheng and Steinberger that actually led to revisiting the H coefficient method. So up to this point, people have sort of forgotten at least the uh, H coefficient method uh, that I presented yesterday. And then finally today, I'll explain you uh, how we got the uh, even, even tighter bound and I'll explain you what it means. And so actually it's kind of interesting because somehow there was um, yeah, a fixation uh, to kind of get um, something that looked like this, because that was what, what the best attack that uh, people thought about uh, was achieving. But it was interesting that most of the prior results were actually not getting there. Uh, in particular, when you look at it from a, a very concrete perspective, so what I'm plotting here is uh, the um, number of queries on the, on the y-axis. It's kind of a weird plot, but it's kind of helpful to compare these results and what they were saying and what they were not saying. And so in this, uh, on the x-axis, you have advantage, which is kind of log scale. And basically, uh, what a point here uh, means is that you take a number of query, you take a particular advantage, and I want to color it in either red or green, depending on whether you have uh, security for those parameters or not. So for a particular Q epsilon, I want to color it green if no adversary with Q queries can achieve advantage in most epsilon, whereas I want to color it red if there exists an attack. So with that number of queries, I can actually distinguish with advantage epsilon. And so there is an attack that roughly achieves uh, security, QR uh, plus one, so Q is the number of query, N is the size of the domain, so it's equal to the two to the small n, and then N to the R, so that's this area above. And so all of these bounds, we're trying to approximate this, but they were sort of like, either you know, having some ugliness in terms of introducing some weird constants or some weird exponents that were sort of failing to quite actually get there. And um, in fact, some of them that were claimed to be better were only better asymptotically. So that's the example of the Chen Steinberger work of our prior work, and actually it was only really better for a very uh, narrow margin of things. So it's a kind of interesting that somehow uh, you know, the, the final work we had this was sort of matching what was the best attack, but the interesting thing about it is not so much um, the fact that we solved that problem, but I find it the more interesting part is that it really happened by rethinking how we were casting prior proofs. In fact, at this point, it is fair to say that the hard combinatorial part that we used in our proof, as you will see, was actually due to Chen and Steinberger, but what we were not doing right is that we're not putting it together with the right method at the end. So that's mostly what I want to focus on today, but I just want to give you a bit of motivation that this was not a crazy problem coming out of nowhere, but it was something that quite a few people spent uh, time working on uh, over this range of years. So again, uh, last, just to make it a bit more precise, again, what we are proving can be cast in the language we introduced before, although it's easier to think of it in terms of pseudocode. So we're really proving indistinguishability of these two worlds with different um, uh, behavior with respect to these queries. So the real world is where you have these R-independent permutations, 
the uh, secret keys are chosen, actually here there's a typo, there's a K0 missing. And then uh, you can do one of two things. You can evaluate these permutations. Now there's R of them. So the query will tell you which permutation you want to uh, evaluate and then the input. And you can do this forward or backward. And then the other thing are these encryption decryption queries which allow you to evaluate the construction under the secret key. So you either forward, you start with the input and add the keys and then iterate the construction until you get the output or backwards. And we compare this with an ideal world where you still have this independent permutation, but the encryption decryption query queries are answered by an independent permutation pi. And um, that's uh, what we get. So we want to show now a bound on how well we can distinguish these two worlds. Right. So this is the main theory we're going to prove. So it's actually a bit more concrete than what I told you before. So I actually want to distinguish the number of queries that we make to the, the encryption decryption queries uh, from the number of queries we make to the underlying permutations. And that actually uh, is something I haven't gone much into yesterday, but I realized some of you had questions. Uh, because um, I haven't motivated much what this model is really about and why do we care? I mean, so, so one first question, why do we even care? Oops, why do we even care about this analyzing this construction? Uh, it's really because key alternating ciphers are a common family of block cipher construction. So in particular, IAS in some sense uh, can be cast within this framework, although in the case of AES, uh, most of these permutations are the same. So this is maybe not the best abstractions, but the hope was that it tells us something about block ciphers like AES by understanding the structure. And then when you do that, really, as I told you briefly yesterday, the problem that we have is that these permutations in reality are fixed functions that you can write down an algorithm for and you can evaluate, but we have no idea how to actually uh, prove anything. Uh, it's a huge open question that you should think about if you love this type of questions, but probably doesn't have a nice answer. So we would like to have some well-defined uh, theoretical guarantees that we can assume on that permutation so that the construction is a pseudo-random permutation. So we don't know how to do that. So what we do instead, we try to uh, give some halfway security guarantee where we are in a world where these permutations are just black boxes that we can query, they behave ideally, hoping that we can infer from these things, for example, that there are no generic attacks that treat these permutations as black boxes. And so when you think about that, then the evaluation of these permutations versus the evaluation of the construction have very different semantics. So uh, what th this type of queries really correspond to encrypting and decrypting data, so they actually involve honest users doing work for you. They can decide not to encrypt after a while. Whereas these queries to the permutations, they really abstract local computation. So this is just, you're abstracting the fact that you can evaluate the permutation as a black box. So it's a very different type of resource. So this, you're, not, you're only limited by your computing power, how much you evaluate this. These honest users might just have some rekeying practices that might only allow you to encrypt so much with one key. And so that's why we have a parameter Q for these queries and a parameter P for these queries. Okay. And so we want a bound that depends on both, and that, that's what we're going to prove. But again, mostly what I want to do now from a pedagogical perspective, and first trying to explain to you how we will attack the problem using the H-coefficient method, which is what Shannon Steinberger did, and then where they got stuck and got something that looked much uglier than this, and in particular, in this very concrete view where we look at all of these points, this red green plot I showed you before, why they were failing to match the actual attack. So are there any questions here about the high level? So it's even a smaller audience today, so we can... I have a question. Yeah. Um, the proof doesn't change much if you fix the permutation to only one permutation? No, the, the, oh, yeah, no, actually the proof changes a lot if you fix a permutation. So if you say if all of the permutation, are, so one random permutation which is reused across, yeah, that's actually a very hard question, uh, how to do that. So we, we know something about, um, we know something about up to three rounds, uh, but that's all we know. So that's still open? That's still open, yeah, for a, for a general round, yeah. Uh, do we know an attack? Uh, I think with independent keys, um, I'm not sure. I don't think we know. Do you know an attack? I mean, I, I no, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think you can just, 
like if you try to put key schedule in it or other things, then of course it becomes ugly. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I thought only about like reduced round versions and there it doesn't seem to get, you know, it's, it, it, it's a bit uglier, so the bounce, but in terms of like asymptotics, it's the same order of things, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, we have no indication that we shouldn't get something that looks like that, so, yeah. So, okay, so remember, again, just going back to the H coefficient method, so I, again, as I told you, we're not gonna use it at the end to get that theorem, but I wanna still try to use it because it's the right way to think about um, w w how we solve it, right? So again, remember what the goal is, is to find good and bad transcripts and then, um, you know, hopefully we can put them together in this way and get a nice bound. And so, the first thing to think about is again, what is really a transcript? And I'm gonna use slightly more succinct notation than what I used yesterday. So, we have again this, this type of query, so we have these encryption decryption queries, and I'm gonna denote them just easily here like this, so this is an input, this is an output, and this is the direction. Um, and then we have queries to the underlying permutation, for example, this is to the third permutation, so this will be query uh, by three inverse, actually, on V, and we get U out of it. So that's the direction, and then I just write the input output pairs always the same direction. And again, it's not very important because we're not gonna even use this uh, representation, but just to give you a sense what goes into. Um, so a better way to think about this um, is to actually think of it in terms of a graph, uh, which is a common thing we will do when looking at this type of problems. Uh, so basically the way you should look at this graph is, is the following, and we will add things to it, but for now, so I'm, I'm looking at all of the queries to the individual permutation, so here it will be three rounds. Um, but anyway, I haven't talked too much about rounds, I just wanted to clarify that the example I gave you before was for 10 rounds of this plot, but of course we are deriving, a, which is what IAS will do, but we want to talk about arbitrary number of rounds, but here again, let's look just for visualization, let's look at three rounds. And so the way I'm representing the transcript here is that for every query to a permutation, pi one, pi two, pi three, regardless whether it's forward or backwards, we're not gonna care, in fact. Um, I just have an edge uh, between the input and the output, right? So, so an edge like between u prime and v prime means that either I query pi one on u prime forwards and I've gotten v prime, or I query the inverse on v prime, I've gotten u prime. So, and for every um, pi one, pi two, pi three, and so on, I have sort of pair of nodes, so I have two layers of nodes, uh, two to the n of them, where uh, I have inputs and outputs and an edge that connects inputs and outputs. So I do it for pi two, I do it for pi three, and then for the actual encryption queries, I sort of adding these two outer layers of two to the n vertices, right, and this means that I did an, an encryption query either on x that return y or an inverse decryption query that on y return x. So, and then, um, what we are going to do in addition to this, we're gonna do the same trick we used yesterday. In order to describe which transcripts are good or bad, uh, we are going to actually add the secret keys into the transcript uh, with the idea that what is being modeled here is the fact that we give these keys at the end of the execution to uh, the adversary. And we're gonna have this more generous uh, real ideal worlds and still show that they remain indistinguishable. And so again, these keys are, in the real world, are the actual keys that the construction is using. In the ideal world, they are fresh and random and independent of everything else. Same thing as yesterday, except with more keys. And then I'm gonna actually add the keys to this graph. So now these keys are just sort of shifting um, when I go from one round to the next. So what I'm say, thinking here is that, so if I have some so the edge here is gonna go from, so you think of this as strings, these two to the n nodes, so in here you have an edge between x and x, x or k zero, and then here you have an edge between say y and y x or k one, right? So I kind of did the parallel like this, although it's not the right visualization with strings, but just to give you an idea that all points are shifted by the same key. So it's a simple permutation, it's not this random permutation that we had before. So there any question about this representation? Okay, okay, so now, so this is just a different way to represent the information that an adversary has gathered during an execution, so the transcript. 
And now there are some interesting things that can happen and we should reflect about. And one particular thing that could happen, and again, it's not clear that it's likely to happen, is that somehow the adversary manages to sort of make queries to the underlying permutation. So this query here, this query here, this query here, and also make an encryption decryption query. So it's this long edge here such that it so happens that when the keys are revealed, the adversary will uh, realize that it has actually made all of the internal evaluations of the construction on uh, the underlying permutation. So the, the adversary knows that X maps to Y through the construction, but it also knows that X maps to Y because uh, the adversary has made all of those queries internally, and then by, by chance, the corresponding keys are also connecting uh, these, these edges so the, 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 the adversary knows all of the internals of the evaluation of the construction. And so you're going to say, well, so what? Right? So that, that's what's expected. But the problem is that that's true in the real world. But in the ideal world, because the outer permutation we are evaluating for encryption and decryption is random and independent, so really bizarre things could happen where the adversary happens to create such paths, but then realizes that they're sort of disconnected because actually what is being evaluated for the encryption decryption query is a random and independent permutation. So it's very unlikely to connect. Uh, so it's very unlikely that you can literally connect the dots here in the middle and actually see that the evaluation is consistent. So if you happen in that situation, then you know that you are in the ideal world. Because in the real world, if you had evaluated all of the construction internally, you will get something consistent with the input outputs of the uh, encryption decryption query. And so um, the point is that whenever such things happen, we are in danger. And so what we call such a path that connects to an encryption decryption query and then extend until meeting somewhere in the middle is what we call a chain. And that's a situation where, in general, we will be able to distinguish between real and ideal world. And so the first idea that we have is to just say, well, Whenever we have a transcript, let's look at it. And if we do have a chain, then we say that that transcript is bad. And if you think about it, this idea is just a generalization of what we did yesterday. We didn't need to write it like this with graph or everything, but our bad event for even Mansoor was exactly that. Like if we have an encryption decryption queries and a corresponding internal query, then we lost. And this is just a generalization of that. And it turns out, that this looks promising because you can compute rather easily the probability that in the ideal world you will get such a chain. The bound that you get is, is of the right order, so something of the form q times p to the r over n to the r. So why is that the case? Right? So the point is that you have this, you have this um, you know, say for two, you have this sort of permutation queries that you learn about and you have at most p for say pi 1 and pi 2 and what is the probability and then you have this outer encryption decryption paths out here and so what is the probability that you're going to get a chain in the ideal world well it's when I get the actual key at the end and I generate them a random I have q choices for these long edges and then for each one of these short edges, I have p choices. So in this case, I have q times p squared. And then I'm hoping that the keys are going to connect them so that I have a chain. And then you have r plus 1 here. So there's a union bound because you have different places where the chain can be open. So you don't care about connecting them in the middle. And then this is the probability that the keys that you're going to choose are going to make consistent uh, the chain actually a chain. So that's basically what it is. Uh, I didn't have good slides for this, but it's sort of intuitive that this is the right order of probability that we get. And so that's actually great because it looks like we are on the right path. So if this is the probability of getting a bad transcript, now we better hope that the other step of the H coefficient method will work out, and then we are done. So does it work out? Well, obviously, I told you there's going to be a problem, so probably not, but I want to discuss now what, what goes wrong. Right, so the point now is that we want to say, okay, let's, look at, let's take a good transcript. So what good transcript means is no chain. 
And um, now we want to try to show uh, a lower bound on the ratio of these probabilities of the form 1 minus epsilon. Okay? So that's what we need to do. So when I told you that we're actually going to rely on work that was done before, so what I meant is that in the paper by Chen and Steinberger that uh, achieved this sort of suboptimal bound, so what they did is they actually get, did a lot of work uh, in terms of combinatorics. It's also actually rather tedious. But they actually derived um, a very precise lower bound on the ratio of the interpolation probabilities for good transcripts that do not contain a chain. And they derive uh, this fairly scary looking formula. And there are some elements that you should care about, some elements that you should not care about. But it's basically a, a, a very long inclusion exclusion proof that it's not very insightful to go through here. But I want to illustrate what this formula says and why this is a problem for what we want to do. So in particular, this is like what should be the epsilon that we want. And it's this very complicated expression where the outer sum is over the Q encryption decryption query, so over the long edges in the graph. And then you have this, you know, this kind of like sum and then a nested sum and a product. And they involve a bunch of different quantities that um, might be good to know about. So there is this Zij quantity. So basically what Zij is, is the number of completed paths, so that are connected through keys, that involve the permutations from pi i1 to pi j. So like if you have a path, uh, something like this, here, that will be a path that counts to uh, z, z02 because it involves pi1 and pi2, right? So that will add one, right? And, and so on. So you might have some longer, some shorter paths for every ij if you have a path that uh, involve pi, plus one, pi i plus one to pi j, that counts towards the ij. So it's a particular quantity. You stare at the transcript, you draw the graph, and then you find these paths, you count them. That's the ij. Then uh, there's this bizarre sum here. So there's actually an outer sum that is going to sum over all pairs a and b of numbers such that a is larger than b and b is smaller or equal to the number of rounds. And then here you're summing over, basically once you fix a and b, you are looking at all sort of subset of numbers i1, i2, so i0, i1, i2 all the way to it, where i0 is equal a, it is equal b, and then uh, you, you, know, you have numbers in between. And then you're going to have this product over, so you fix one such subset, and then you're going to have these projects over all ij's, so all of like, subsequent pairs of indices in here. It doesn't really matter, but I just want to give you a chance to parse the formula. And then the, this outside thing here are some 0, 1 coefficients that do not matter much for what I'm about to say. So it just means some of these terms are going to be included, some of these terms are going to be 0. So this is going to be, basically it's a compact way to say that you don't really sum over all A, B pairs here. Okay, so very nasty looking formula. And of course the challenge that you encounter is like, okay, who cares? Can you just tell us, can you upper bound this monster through some single epsilon that uh, is going to just allow us to conclude the proof? And unfortunately, that's exactly where the problem comes in. The point is that this quantity that you have on the right hand side, it's more like an epsilon of tau. So it's a quantity that really depends on the particular transcript and it could be larger or lower depending on the transcript you're looking at. And if you were to take the maximum it can potentially achieve, so you're gonna end up with a huge epsilon, although very few transcripts actually achieve that, uh, that large, that maximum, right? And so in Chen and Steinberger, they were kind of stuck dealing with this. And what they did uh, is, you know, they, they had the following observation, which is that, well, actually, if you look at what you expect this, this, these crazy values in the formulas to look like, for example, if you look at Zij, which again is the number of completed paths that involve pi i plus one all the way to pi j, you can make a similar argument to what I was doing before. Like, let's see, what are the odds that I actually get keys that connect the queries I've made? And realize that in expectation, this Zij looks like a nice number, which is kind of what it should be. Um, 
And also, again, I didn't tell you, tell you what these binary things are, but again, in expectation, they look nice. And it turns out that if it were the case that these values that are in the formula happen to be their expectation, so they are exactly their expectation, then the epsilon will also be of the order we want, something like uh, q times p to the r over n to the r. But that's only true if these values are equal to their expectation. Right? And as you probably know, uh, very boring random variables have that property only. Right? So the expectation is the expectation, but there's some variance. These random variables might be all over the place, and that's only their expected value. Right? So we are really stuck with this problem. So we have an epsilon. We're different from what we've done before. It's an epsilon of the transcript. It can vary a lot. It's hard to give a unique upper bound to it. But we do know that in expectations, the values that are there look nice. So they, they will actually be the right thing. But unfortunately, they can vary a lot. So what Chen and Steinberger did briefly is that they really did what is the brute force approach you could do in this situation. They said, well, let me just use concentration and say that you know, with some good probability, these values are going to be close enough to their expectation. And then, OK, if they deviate too much, I'm going to throw away this transcript and say that it is bad. But if they are close enough to their expectation, then I'm going to do approximately what I've done before. So but unfortunately, what's the problem? The problem is that we know very little about these random variables in terms of the distribution. So the only concentration you can use here is Markov's inequality which is sort of the worst that you can actually do. So all you can do is that show that the probability to say this zij, each one of them, is you know, more than t times away from their expectation is at most 1 over t, which is very loose. Yeah? Z, OK, good. Um, let me go back. So it's, again, I, I, I'm trying to carry out a meta point where this is not very important, but let's go back to it. Uh, so zij is the number of paths in the graph that involve the permutation pi i plus 1 to pi j. Right? So for example, right? so if I had something like this, right? so it's not completely plotted out here. If I have a, a query like this, and I have a query like this, then I will have a path here that involves pi 1, pi 2. So this will count towards the z0, 2. Does this make sense? Or But the point here is that it's not that important. I'm just telling you a lot of words. So what's more important is the fact that we do have a quantity that depends on the actual transcript. So you look at the transcript, you look at the graph, and then there's some combinatorial property of this graph that every transcript might have a will have a, generally a different quantity. And this quantity can vary depending on the transcript. And we know that its expectation is good. So if the expectation, um, if this va random variable will always have the same value as its expectation, Right, so everything will look nice, but fortunately it doesn't. Right? So then, of course, you know, to really understand the expectation, we need to look what this value is, but what this value really represents. But it's, that's, that's a lower level point that you needed to actually compute the expectation. Okay. Yeah. So, so the meta point I want to make here is that you can do something like that, where you just say, OK, if the values are nice in the expectation, that's a property of the transcript. Let's just include all of the transcript where this value is too far from the expectation in the, uh, in the bad transcripts. Let's only keep those for which the value is not too far. But because unfortunately, this random variable, whatever it is, it's not nice. So you can't do churn of bounds or other things. It turns out that this is very loose. So you really make a proof which is very lossy. And so again, intentionally, I don't want to go too much into the details. But the point is that that's where you end up getting a pretty bad bound. So they had all of the right ideas, but when they were at this point, all they can do is use Markov and then pack this together in a, in a pretty kind of very coarse way that was not uh, the best. Okay. So are there any questions? Again, I, I'm trying to keep this at the meta level, but what I want to point out here, so if there's one line you want to remember is this fact that you might just not be able to find a single epsilon that works well for all transcripts. Yes. Um, so coming back to uh, when using hedge coefficient, uh, the probability of getting a bad transcript where you just give a sketch of um, uh, the probability. You mean this? Uh, yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, um, so when you have the term p to the power r, uh, 
but uh, P is the number of total internal permutation evaluations right. by the adversary. So, uh, does it give like a tightness because you can use the fact that the sum over all red arrows between the pies should be equal to P? Yeah, sorry, I don't hear you well because uh, the fan is running. Uh, so, in the graph, the, the total number of red arrows in the graph across yep. the permutation should be equal to P, right? Should be, sorry? P? Should be equal to P, uh, the total number of red arrows in each oh, graph yeah, of the transfer. Yeah, so Right, so I, I've been very loose here, yeah. so, and uh, I'm basically, you know, saying it's it's at most p for each it, one of these chores, right? But yeah, so the way I described it before, you can just think, of, yeah. So let's let's lose at this. Let's look at this simplified regime where we say you can make at most p queries for pi one and most p queries for pi two. Otherwise, you will have a, a better bound because, uh, but you have to work a little bit harder because you have to look at what is the optimal distribution, right, which is the kind of you spread them out across all of the pi 1 to pi But one. does it help if you do the sum in the end, or it's like a really like a small advantage? I mean, uh, advantage? It, it, it helps, uh, I think, so if you do that, it probably helps you a little bit in a sense that you're going to get uh, uh, p over r here, but it gets to give you a slightly tighter bound. I mean, it's just a different parameterization, right? So, okay. um, so it's, mostly it's a, it's a difference whether you decide to parameterize these resources in terms of p is an upper bound for each query to pi one. For so individually, you have p queries, so whether you give a, an upper bound, so you're measuring something different. Okay. Um, yeah. So I mean, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, but it doesn't help you in the other issue, for example, which is actually the main issue. Yeah, you will have a different, slightly different bound here. Yeah. But it's a good question. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Could you give us a sense of why this doesn't work anymore when pi is the same each time? Oh. So, so, oh, right. So why doesn't it work when pi is the same? So actually, this part still works uh, for the bad transcript because the way we did it is we just make the queries and then look at the graph at the end. And then uh, you can just see what, how many paths you I mean, you have to be, it's a bit different now because now you don't have these separated parts of the graph, but you can define something equivalent to that. But uh, this lemma um, that I mentioned here, the one with the ugly formula, that one requires independence of the pi, pi 1 to pi r. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so, the, the, so the interesting thing here, uh, which is really, I don't know, I feel it's, it's, you know, the more I explain this, the more it's actually sort of really obvious in retrospect, is that sort of the, um, the, the fact that they, the proof that they had before using the H coefficient method was really not giving a good bound, was more like a byproduct of the fixation of using something like the H coefficient method, uh, rather than the fact that they were thinking about it in, 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 so in, in the wrong way and they did a lot of unnecessary work. So what do I mean by that? So it turns out that the, the H coefficient method or this idea of using good and bad transcripts is really just a very um, sort of rough way of putting things together. And you can do something much more refined if you take one step back and you actually look what we did uh, to get there, which is what we did yesterday. So. In particular, there is a much, there's a smoother version of the theorem, or a kind of very smooth version of the theorem that leads to the H coefficient method that you could prove, where basically what you show is the following, is you show, well, imagine that I can give some non-negative function, epsilon, and it's a function of the transcript, which has the property that it upper bounds the, um, so you can look at the different, or maybe one way to write it, which is closer to what we had before. So we look at this one minus the ratio of the probabilities. And I want to show that this is upper bounded by this function epsilon of tau. So the reason I write it like this is because I want to take into account also the possibility that the probability for G is zero. But that's the idea you should have. So rather than upper bounding this to some epsilon, I upper bound it with some epsilon of the transcript. And it turns out that actually, we don't have to think too hard. One thing we can write is that the distinguishing advantage now is actually upper bounded by this quantity. What is this quantity? This is the expectation of this function apply when what you do is you sample a transcript from the interaction with G. So you run the distinguisher D, any distinguisher that makes Q queries. So hopefully you can upper bound this for all distinguisher. 
you run it with G, you look at the transcript, you apply this function epsilon that depends on the transcript, it's gonna give you some number, and now compute this expectation, and that's the bound, so that works. And it turns out that the H coefficient method is just a special case of this, where basically what you do, you do a very rough choice of this function, a very rigid choice of this function epsilon, where you just say, well, for epsilon, if I have a transcript which I call bad, I set this function epsilon to one. If the transcript is good, I set this function epsilon to uh, some constant epsilon for which I prove something in the ratio. And now if you plug this in into this uh, expectation, I get exactly what the H coefficient method gives me, right? So uh, you can do this as a little exercise, but it's, it's exactly what the H coefficient method was doing. But the point is that you don't need to do that. You could actually do something uh, much more refined and so just to see why this is true, by the way, we, we just can go back to what we did yesterday. This is almost the same slide I had yesterday where we had written the distinguishing advantage like this. Then we had transformed it into this expression just using the uh, um, interpolation probability for a deterministic distinguisher D. And then uh, you do this little rewriting here. And then if you, go, uh, if you go on with this, then you can just say, well, we have this. Now, we prove that there is such a function epsilon of the transcript that upper bounds this, and this is just the expectation of that function, and you're done. So it's actually easier, to, like, you have to think even less than in showing why the H coefficient method actually works. And now, why do we care? Well, because it turns out that exactly for this type of problems, when I'm having a hard time finding a unique epsilon that upper bounds everything, it might be possible to just look at the expectation of a function that depends on the transcript that we might be better off. And so in particular here, I'm not gonna do the entire computation because I'm just trying to give you the idea. But what we do here is we can define a function epsilon that has the following property. For a particular transcript tau, what I'm gonna set it to, so if the transcript is good, I'm gonna set it exactly to this ugly expression that came from the Chen and Steinberger analysis. They already proved that for such good transcript, the ratio is at least one minus this quantity. And if the transcript is bad, so there is a chain, then we just set this to one. And now it turns out that because all of the expectations of these involved quantities are nice, and here, by the way, coming back to your question, also because we have independence of the permutations that will allow us to say things like the fact that in uh, the ideal world, something like Z13 and Z34, so these random variables are going to be independent. So if they have non-overlapping ranges of values, so now you can, you can use multiplicative of expectation for independent random variables and linearity of expectation to actually come up with a rather simple proof that show that the expectation of this function epsilon applied to any other ideal world transcript, which makes it rather easy to analyze, um, is upper bounded exactly by what we wanted. And so it's actually much easier than anything Chen and Steinberger were trying to do. You just have to have the idea to think of this as a variable function of the transcript and that you, all you need to do is to compute an expectation. I mean, I'm not gonna do the calculation here, but there's nothing extremely hard in it. It's really about the fact that there's independence and linearity. So it's a bunch of sums. You can break them up in individual expectations that you're summing up, and that's it. And so, again, so the lesson here is that sometimes it's helpful to take a few step back, steps back and then you know, realize that maybe you're trying to do something only because you've done this all, over the, all of the time, but maybe that's not the best thing that you should be doing. Right? And, and so what it also tells us is that this idea that we have good and bad transcript, we are used to it, many analyses work out that way, but it's just really the restrictions that we are making uh, because it works, but it's not necessarily the best thing that you should be doing for every problem. Okay, so. Right. Yeah. Right, so that's an excellent question. Thanks for asking, Evgeny. So, you know, another way to think about it, right, you could just say, well, maybe I generalize the H coefficient method to have like a bunch of different like classes of things where I have different ratios. 
And this expectation method is sort of an extreme version, right? When right. I go down to the granularity of just like one in every transcript in the worst case, yeah. No, but, but, but in your case, uh, was there like 23 classes? So it was really like, uh, you know, a really right. big number of classes. I mean, it's, all, it's not kind of worth thinking about it, right? So yeah, you will have all of these different values that this function can take, and they are like your different classes. So they are more than constant. So it's not like in your case, where like really like four different terms, and there was like epsilon one, delta one, plus epsilon two, delta two, as well, like your sum split into four things were really, I mean, the sum was like complicated. It was like really right, a lot of Right, it's complicated. Class. And the point is that when you compute it directly as an expectation and you don't think yeah. about that, it's actually nicer because you can just use linearity and uh, multiplicativity of independent random variable. But you could do the exercise and figure out how many levels of values there are. And, uh, but it doesn't make it much easier to I think see. about. So. So you don't have an, an example where there would be like maybe four classes or three classes? No, I don't have it's a good example with It's four either extreme or two. I with John as well. I don't know. Yeah. Like, that, that's actually why they give up. Look, when, when John uh, was writing the paper, yeah. uh, they, they thought about having more classes, but then they couldn't find anything useful for four. So it seems that it's more useful if you go to this extreme case of like, taking a smooth expectation. But I don't have a good example with four. But maybe there is one. I just don't know about it. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's a good example. I, uh, Maybe it's not related, but yeah, we, when we have this uh, paper on non-malleable codes, I mean, there was like something very refined, it's like depending on the function, the split. There, there was like, a, like you know, eight cases, but I'm not sure, I haven't thought about it as like H coefficient method. Like this paper with Divesh uh, uh -huh. and uh, yeah, Shahar. I, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, not that it would help that, I mean, yeah. we stated a lemma like that, we didn't call it H coefficient, but yeah, there was actually like, I don't know, like nine cases or something like that, but anyway. Yeah, it would be good to have like a nice example yeah. that, yeah, but here it's not, it's, I don't know, I think it's not a, a nice number, so. Okay, so any other questions? So we can, you know, now, because yesterday I was like blamed for not claiming that we will have a break, but we won't have one, so let's have a one minute real break otherwise, and then to resume to the. Uh, so there is a lesson is you need somebody like, you know, from Uli's group to apply this method, right? Like a former student of Uli to apply this method, like Divesh or you or something like that, right? Uh, it's pretty technical. Sure. I mean, yeah. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's a lesson. <laughs> I don't know why. Well, without Divesh, we would have no chance. I mean, this guy oh, was like oh, relentless. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. did like this nine cases. I thought he would never end. Yeah. I was like, no way it would end. And somehow he, he finished. It's a long the, proof, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, it's nice. Uh, actually, you know, I should have done the computation to convince you. It's actually, yeah. it's actually really short because yeah. it's really, it's really nice to think about it on expectations. So I don't know if actually nine cases it will have helped you. Maybe that was. Yeah. I guess if you have to write down the expectation and then break the proof into nine different terms, yeah. then it's exactly yeah. the same thing. But, yeah, that was. But here it, it works really smoothly. So this is a different panda, panda from yesterday. This, this is a not real panda. Yeah. It's not red panda. It's. Uh, yeah, the red panda is actually white. not a. I see. Is it a thing? They, I, I, I went to the zoo in Boston. They, they had the current panda there. Is it like a thing now, red pandas They're everywhere? They're trendy. Seattle yeah. as well? Yeah. yeah, we have one in Seattle. We have a few in Seattle, yeah. Nice. OK, so you have gaining used the whole, the whole break. But can, yeah. So now the great break is over. OK, <laughs> good. Um, all right, so I, I, I want to give you a second example, uh, very different technically of where, uh, again, things become easier by not thinking about it in terms of bad and uh, good and bad transcript. And this is actually a different way of getting to a bound, uh, which is farther away from what the H coefficient does. And so here, um, so the, the basic toolkit that we're going to use is just a little bit of information theory. And so have you know one realization, which is that when I defined things yesterday, and I was defining the distinguishing advantage, um, I, we used uh, total variation distance, so we used this, also because that's the right thing to do uh, when we think as cryptographers, because total variation has this operational interpretation in terms of an actual distinguisher telling things apart. But uh, from a statistical perspective or information theoretic perspective, so total variation is just one out of many different distances, and uh, outside of crypto, or recently also in crypto, um, you know, one realization is that sometimes problems um, change completely and might become significantly easier when you decide to look at it from the perspective of a difference distance metric or distance measure or divergence in this case. And, and then maybe just bring things back to the total variation setting at the end through some uh, standard relation. And so what we are going to, for example, one thing that is common to, to look at, because it, 
really introduces a whole set of different properties that are useful for some problems uh, to actually use, look at KL divergence, uh, the kullback leibler divergence, which is a very different um, way of measuring distance or probability distribution than total variation. And in fact, it's, it's not even a proper distance measure. It's not symmetric. That's why I use this weird notation. And it's very related to the Shannon theoretic view of uh, sort of probability and Shannon entropies, where you have these like very bizarre logs, uh, which you haven't seen and they might look really weird. So you're basically waiting. So you took the probability on the left. You weight with that probability this log of um, probability of x according to p and probability of x uh, relative to q. You look at the ratio, you take a log, and then you weight according to one of the two distributions. And it does turn out that the, there is a connection, this is well-known Pinsker's inequality, uh, between total variation and KL divergence. Um, so you can show that the total variation is upper bounded by 1 over square root 2 times the square root of the KL divergence of the same distributions. And so like you could think that maybe, just maybe, it does make sense to upper bound the distinguishing advantage as well. So remember, the distinguishing advantage was the total variation distance between the transcripts. And so the question is whether certain problems might become easier if instead of um, looking at total variation distance, you look at KL divergence of the transcript for whatever reason, and then just use Pinsker's inequality to get an upper bound on the advantage. Right? You can ask the question with any other distance metric, right? but KL is a, is a common one. And Somehow this view was not very common in uh, symmetric crypto, not, not common at all, that uh, was used elsewhere, that the problem might actually get easier, and in some cases, you know, this is really worth it. And so one problem when, uh, which is a good example of this, where this has ended up helping, is, is the following question, which is actually also rather fundamental in symmetric crypto, and it's really the following, the following problem. So, I told you yesterday about pseudo-random functions and pseudo-random permutations. Right? Remember, a pseudo-random function is something which is indistinguishable from a random function. A pseudo-random permutation is something which is indistinguishable from a random permutation. Now, what's the difference between the two? Well, it's in one of the two, you're enforcing a one-to-one -one property structurally. In the other one, you're not. So every output is meant to look random and independent, and outputs can, in particular, collide. So it turns out that it's much easier to work with pseudo-random functions, but it's much uh, easier in practice to find suitable instantiation for pseudo-random permutations. So you have uh, a yes, uh, or any block cipher, gives you a good candidate for a pseudo-random permutation, but if you want to build a message authentication code or a key duration function or whatnot, ideally you want to have something that outputs truly random outputs that are independent for each input and that approximates that. So we really want to get a pseudo-random permutation, and then transform it into a pseudo-random function. And to a certain degree, we know that one implies the other, because yesterday we proved the switching lemma, which you probably also know from before, that a random permutation is indistinguishable from a random function up to the birthday barrier, so up to 2 to the n over 2 queries. Unfortunately, um, Sometimes uh, people are not happy with that, and they want to get security, which is higher, for different reasons, either because we are in a setting where n is small, or just because we care about getting uh, highest possible security levels as possible, so the highest possible security level. And so, so you really have this problem that say, you, you might have, um, so for, for, for something like AES, unfortunately, it's not a good candidate for a pseudo-random function. For example, if you plug in uh, you know, 2 to the 110, as the number of queries and running time for which you want to have security, and AES would be a good pseudo-random permutation in that regime is not a good pseudo-random function. Right? Because of that regime, it's more than 2 to the 64 queries. Then if you evaluate AES, you will notice that outputs are never repeating. By that point, you've seen enough outputs to be certain that you're not looking at a random, as something that looks like a random function. And so the question here has really been, well, if we actually want to go beyond the birthday barrier, how can we give, build a good pseudo-random function from a uh, pseudo-random permutation? And so there was a natural approach that uh, was proposed in the, um, in the late 90s um, by uh, almost simultaneously actually by Bellare, Krovitz, and Rogaway, and by Hal Wagner, Kelsey, and Schneider. They came up with this idea without actually a, a very good proof for it that maybe if you do the following, so I have a, 
a block cipher, which is a good pseudo-random permutation. And now I evaluate it under two different keys on the same input x. Now these outputs are going to be one to one, but because they are on independent keys, maybe I'm lucky, so they have some sort of independence of when I XOR them together. So I get this output and it's going to destroy this pseudo-random permutation property, this one-to-one -one property, and really give us something which is very close to a random function, okay? And there's also a variant of this construction where you have the same key, because it might be more relevant in practice, and then what you do is that you do some sort of domain separation where you prepend a one and zero to the input before evaluating. So here you sort of lose one bit of the input uh, to do that, to reuse the key. So anyway, this proposed these two constructions and the question was like, are they actually uh, really good to the random functions now? So is it possible that now, no, uh, even for attackers that make way more than two to the n over two queries where this is n, is it possible that they cannot distinguish uh, from a random function? And so again, it turns out that the core of this question is uh, purely information theoretic. So again, I want to also say that this ended up being important in a bunch of symmetric construction, although we focus more on the math here. But the question is not just a toy question, so this, this problem comes up. Um, and so the, the, but the analysis question here is again uh, mostly information theoretic. Because again, if you try to analyze this, if these are, you know, you expect this to be good to the random permutation, and you want to analyze how well is the PRF advantage. So here I write this as what's the best advantage in distinguishing this from a random function for an adversary running in time t and making Q queries. And what you will do in the proof is you will first replace the, uh, the, the, the keyed functions with truly random permutations by using the fact that they are good to the random permutations. And so here the loss that you will have is just related to how good of a pseudo random permutation this E is, and then what you're stuck here is in understanding how good of a pseudo-random function is this construction where you're instantiated with truly random permutations. And then again, it's a purely information theoretic question. Uh, it doesn't really help you to bound the running time. It's really a statistical question. You're given Q queries, how well can you tell apart? And this is really the question we care about uh, now and the question many before have been um, caring about. So the, this problem actually has some history. Like it, it was pretty clear from the beginning that the uh, security should be kind of optimal, but it turned out that analyzing it was not that easy. So I think the first work that did something explicitly is a paper that was never published actually. It's available on ePrint by uh, Bellare and Russell in Pagliazzo that basically proved that you get indistinguishability with a bound, the guarantees indistinguishability up to almost optimal, so like two to the n over n. So their bound was something like n times q over two to the n. Um, one reason why it was never published is, well, I'll come back to that um, when my slides resume working. Okay, yeah, so one reason that this was never published is actually there were some minor errors. It's actually kind of weird because uh, it, it actually doesn't happen much with me here, but uh, the paper is still online without any note that it's actually kind of wrong. Uh, so you wouldn't know uh, if you look at it, but that's, that's why this, this, this proof is there, it's never published, and actually Stefan looks like one year later at a paper at Eurocrypt that was showing, showing actually an inferior uh, uh, security guarantee. So it was a non-tight bound of Q cube over two to the N, guarantees indistinguishability up to two to the two N over three, uh, and that was uh, correct, but not as, as good. And then there's been a whole saga that started with the work of Pataran uh, in 2008 that actually claimed optimal security. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. So the table is a bit weird because I try to sort of keep the temporal order, but then not quite. Um, so we're basically, the, there were a few of works that tried to analyze this construction and basically build a whole combinatorial theory, which is known as mirror theory around it, which was really mainly motivated by uh, the question of finding an optimal bound for this construction. And the reason why things are rather weird is that until very recently, so and I'm talking maybe uh, right now, I don't know actually if both of these papers have even been accepted, maybe I tire so you know, but uh, 
there were, um, the, the, the whole work on mirror theory was sort of uh, a little bit incomplete. So it looked like the, the theorems were claiming the right thing, but if you try to dig into it, this is a rather monumental piece of work. So it's maybe like 50, 60 pages of proofs. And there were definitely some gaps that were not filled. And so it was really hard also to fill them, so it was not clear whether that proof was, was really correct. And recently there have been some works, one by Kolyatin Pataren, another one by Dutta Nandian Saha, that actually have been uh, fixing things. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not yet 100% you know, sure whether they've been accepted and completely verified, but they look very solid. And they sort of fix this thing using mirror theory. So what is mirror theory really is, it really builds on top of H coefficient and what we are seeing now, and it's a rather sort of brute force approach to the question by using really, really hard combinatorics. So what I want to show you today, however, is a different approach to uh, proving things that uses this information theoretic view and really give a rather, gives a rather succinct proof of these statements. And we almost get what you can get from mirror theory. So for uh, the construction with one single key, the hour bounds is slightly a loser. For uh, deconstruction uh, using two keys, which I'm going to analyze, it's what I call XOR2, we are going to actually get a bound which is better than the one that Pataran initially claimed, in the sense that that was Q over to the n, we get Q over to the n to the 1.5, so it's even smaller. So recently, uh, the work by Dutta et al. claims uh, a, 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 an exponent of two. Uh, so it, this exponent can also be improved. However, I, I'm not sure whether one needs mirror theory for that. I think you, you might be able to have more refined methods that also improve this exponent. So we'll stick with this today, because I really think it shows you something which is really succinct that I can actually present and shows you how you can benefit from this different view on the advantage. So are there any questions about the, the context? This is a rather long context, which is a bit dry, but we'll go back to the math now. So, okay, so how are we attacking this question? So what I'm going to do now, I, I'm going to go back to our formalism and introduce a slightly different angle on uh, proving indistinguishability. Where um, this is just really notation, but basically what I want to look at, I want to look at partial transcripts now. So if we have an interaction, I want to look at the transcript up to the ith query and for an interaction with either f or g. And now, if I have such a fixed value for this partial transcript, I want to define a quantity which basically looks at the statistical difference between the answers to the next query uh, from the two systems. So basically, what we want to do is we, we go back to the original notation from random systems where we see, okay, let's assume that the interaction has been fixed up to this point. And now, um, so we are making the i query, and let's look at the distribution of the outputs that we will get from either of the two systems. And let's call this delta i of tau i, where tau i is this partial transcript up to this point. So is this, again, is this quantity clear? Because we are going to use it quite a bit now, right? So again, I just fix a partial interaction up to the point where I make the i query, and then I, look, I compare the two systems in what the distribution of the output will look like. And what I can actually show is, I mean, a first order thing where this is helpful is uh, what we call a hybrid argument that you might know with a different notation, namely that if we look at this in the regime of, so this is, by the way, statistical distance, what we had here. So the original delta. So if I look at this in the regime of statistical distance, I get uh, the classical hybrid argument that I can just recast here as um, this, this inequality. So I can look at every query. I can do the following. So I run the interaction up to the i query with one of the two systems, say f. And then at the i query, I just check what, let's fix the interaction up to the point with f. Then I make the i query, and I see what's the statistical distance between the distribution of the answers with f and the distribution with g. I do that for every i, so that's all that is, right? It's the statistical distance after the i query averaged over all interactions I can have with f up to the i query. And then I sum it up over all i's, and I get a bound on the distinguishing advantage. 
So for example, if I have a distinguisher that queries either a random function or a random permutation, so I can get another easy proof of the switching lemma by using just this inequality. Because I know that if I look up to the i query and they're all distinct, if I query a random function, I'm going to get a truly random output. If I query a random permutation, I'm going to get something that misses some of the values that I've seen so far. You can actually turn them into a guarantee on statistical distance and show that that's at most something i minus 1 over n. You plug this in, and you get the bound we claim for the switching lemma. So just saying that this is a different way of looking at things, where instead of looking at whole transcripts, like in the h coefficient method, you just look at query after query. What's the statistical uh, behavior of the answer to the next query? And you just sum them up, and you get a bound. So it's a different way of looking at things. And so what I want to do here today is do this method, this hybrid argument. But instead of using total variation, we're going to use um, KL divergence. So you can do it with different distance metrics. Uh, and in fact, I'm not going to even do that. I'm going to use something else as a proxy for KL divergence, which is easier to work with, which is the chi-square distance or the chi-square divergence. So what is chi-square divergence? So it's another measure of uh, how far away two probability distributions are. And the, um, what you do is basically you sum over all possible values, look at something that looks like the L2 distance, so you're squaring the differences, but then you sort of divide each term by the probability with respect to one of the two distributions. That's what uh, chi-square is. Uh, Stefan? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure where the expectation came from two slides before, one slide before. Uh-huh. Good question. So it's, it's, it's a little bit, um, yeah, it, it's a little bit weird here to think about what expectation really means. But um, it's just, OK, what you need to convince yourself is that that's just like a way of writing succinctly the usual hybrid argument, right? Because this is. So taking the expectation over this and then looking at the statistical distance is really equivalent to saying, let me look at the whole distribution of input outputs up to i when interacting with f. And then I can look equivalently at the same thing. But then what happens is that up to here, I'm interacting with f. And then somewhere at the end, I switch to g. So that's exactly what this quantity is. It's just a succinct version of writing it. Because basically what you do is just split out this thing into, I first sample this common part, which is always with respect to f. And then now I just look what's the distance of the next answer. But it's equivalent to say, I just write down this entire vector of value, and then I compute the statistical distance between the two. And then it's, it's, it's sort of, you could complete it adding you know, the answer from G to the next queries, but this you can just like ignore. And then it's exactly the hybrid argument. Um, so for the statistical distance, it's fine. Yeah. It's more about the expectation. Why do you need the expectation here and not? Oh, so what, I, what I'm trying to say is that if I measure a statistical distance of this two distribution, it's exactly equal to the expectation of this. Oh, OK. Yeah. And of course, this is more natural to think about. But it's just the only way that I know how to motivate what's coming next. Um, we're now, instead of, you know, with statistical distance, it makes sense, right? But now, with chi-square divergence, it's a little bit different, because now it doesn't have this very nice interpretation I had before. Um, so now I, I, I just do the same thing. But instead of, I run the execution up to the i query with f. And then I just look, what is chi the chi-square divergence of the answer to the next query, comparing f with g. OK. All right, so why is this helpful? Um, before we wrap up and look at the actual proof of what we want to do. So just to give you an idea, so I imagine really hypothetically, so this is an example where the distinction between statistical distance and chi-square really shines. Um, as if you are in a setting where, so you can show that the behavior of f and g for every query is very close to each other. So if I fixed the interaction up to the i query, and then I look what's the probability that either system returns a particular value y, and now I look at the ratio, it turns out that for every possible interaction, for every possible y, 
the, uh, the two probabilities are very close to each other in ratio in either way. So the, the ratio is between 1 plus epsilon and 1 minus epsilon. So it's very, very tight uh, proximity. And so now, if you are in this situation and you compute this hybrid argument that we were discussing now with, with expectation, so it turns out that, again, for any partial interaction, if you compute the statistical distance once you fix that partial interaction using this property, um, what you get is, I'm just doing some algebra here, with taking this up there and then subtracting. So what you get is that an upper bound of basically epsilon over two for each one of these partial interaction and the statistical distance for the next query. And so if you plug it in in the hybrid argument, you get something that you know, roughly grows as Q times epsilon. Now, what's more interesting is that if you use chi-square divergence, then again, so this difference up here is going to be of order um, epsilon times the probability of G, but then it normalizes away. So, um, so it squares and then I divide by here. So you get something which is roughly epsilon square times the sum of the probabilities for G, which is upper bound by this one. And so you're left with epsilon square. So again, this is just algebra. There's no intuition whatsoever. But the point I want to make is that in some cases, you have very different behaviors of these two hybrid arguments, one with respect to chi-square and the other one with respect to statistical distance. And this epsilon square matters because if you plug it in here, it's under the square root. So epsilon square will become epsilon. But also, you actually have q times epsilon square under the square root. So you get something of the order square root q times epsilon. So, okay, so by doing this, in this hypothetical scenario, we went from Q times epsilon to square root Q times epsilon. This is, of course, a much better growth. Yeah. If I remember correctly, like, the desired effect of getting the square root comes from Pinsker's inequality, right? Comes so from you, this inequality, yeah. And um, so it's a matter of taste, it seemed to me, that you use the chi-squared divergence rather than the KL divergence. So, okay, so the, 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 so the, final, <coughs> the final statement now is with respect to total variation in both cases, right? So it mm. really gives you an improvement. It's not just a matter of ah, taste, it, right? It, so this is what I'm using. So this up to here, it's a matter of taste. But then now it's actually an improvement because when I plug this in and I get a square root all over to convert it to total variation with Pinsker's inequality, now I get something that grows a square root Q times epsilon instead of Q times epsilon. But these are, are really comparing apples to apples. But right? isn't it to remove the log part? Because having logs would be ugly in... Uh... Oh, oh, sorry, you were asking about chi-square versus KL. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's to remove the log and to make things easier. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know if any... Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 I think it, I answered it, yeah. So, so, I think the intuition here is sometimes the ratio is a, a bit above yeah. uh, what you expect, and sometimes it's below. So, when you average things out, then it kind of cancels. That's why... I mean, you get something better than, you know, just the linear Q times epsilon. You get the square root there. I mean, I, that's, I think, intuition that I, uh, I, I, I would suggest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Now, if you add it all in one direction, of course, then, you know, yeah. this is not possible. But, but that's, it's that's both. Bad, that's, you know, yeah. that's sufficient again. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't, I missed the question you were asking before. Yeah. So, right. So, the question that, 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 that so that, that we were asking before was exactly why chi-square over KL, and that's really important. It's just it's much nicer to work with chi-square that doesn't have logs uh, and makes things easier. And the, the connection in most cases is tight, so it's rather tight, so there's not a big loss. Okay, so let's use it in the last 15 minutes uh, to actually prove uh, our bound on this construction. And again, if you really are seeing this for the first time and you feel like halfway excited after all of this math, I hope some of you might, um, uh, then uh, go compare what I'm about to do, although I'm going to skip a few steps with the proofs using mirror theory, and you really appreciate how much simpler this actually is. Although, again, I'm going to skip a few steps, leave it a bit intuitive, but all of the things I'm going to skip are rather easy calculations that you can do on your own. So again, I'm going to prove this bounds using this, this method, right? So I want to compare now a system that evaluates these two random permutations, an XOR. Now it's a simple system. There's only one type of queries versus a system which is the actual random function. So again, the setup is that we want to look at these sort of per query distances that we were looking at with respect to chi-square. 
So what I mean by that is that we look at these partial transcripts, like after i queries, we obtain i minus 1 outputs, and we fix now i queries, so in this case i is equal 4. And now we are interested in looking at the behavior of this i query answer and measure the distance between the two, these two worlds, right? So there is a particular probability distribution that when interacting with the real world, the extra of these two permutations, this, this y4 will follow, which is, again, uh, what we really don't know and we need to study. And we want to compare it with the uniform distribution. So if we were in the actual uh, ideal world, we know that this answer, assuming that all of these queries are distinct without loss of generality, uh, distinguishable will be silly to repeat queries. So this is a fresh query. So we get something which is truly uniform, right? So we want to compare these two. And then we want to plug them in particular into this chi-square related formula. And here, coming back to the question why chi-square, things are really easy because one of the two is the uniform distribution. So chi-square is really helpful here because you remember that we were norm dividing by the second probability, but it's 1 over 2 to the n. So this 2 to the n go up here. And then what you're left here is basically the L2 or Euclidean distance between the probability distribution. So you have this square that we need to evaluate. So things are, look kind of nice. There's a square, it's scary, but not that scary. Okay. And so now we want to bound the expectation. So we run the interaction with the real world. So we, like in this case, up to the third query, make a fourth query, and we want to now evaluate the expectation over this interaction of the chi-square divergence that we have here. Okay, that's what we care about. And actually, because it's expectation, and because the expectation of a sum, so it's equal to the sum of the expectations, so you can actually, and there's a two to the n here that you can take out of the expectation, you can actually do this on a per, per y basis, so for every output, y, all we care about is the corresponding term in this chi-square distance, the square quantity, and we want to upper bound the expectation of that for every y. So things are going to be nice enough that we don't need to worry about good y's and bad y's. All y's are the same. Okay? So we want to do that. So again, what we need to want to do, we want to understand a little bit better this answer to the i query and how it looks like. And so the first thing I want to point out is that it's a little bit easier if we sort of give away to the adversary some extra information about the internals of the evaluation. So instead of just giving the output to the adversary, so this y1 to y2, y3, we actually give to the adversary the individual outputs of the separate permutations. So we can just say, well, imagine that we want to understand this answer to the i query, and you learn the output so far. I actually tell you a little bit more. I tell you the separate outputs of the permutations that are going to be XOR. So you can compute what are the outputs that you would have actually seen, but I tell you a little bit more. And so now I, I really want to look at a different kind of description of the system, which is not the original system, is a new system that actually outputs both u and v, the values that are going to be XOR. Turns out um, it's actually there's, uh, there's, we can do it because I'm not going to prove this, but by um, Jensen's inequality, you can actually say that this, for each one of these terms, the expectation is, only, is not going to become smaller if I look at this new probability, which again is the probability that the i answer now for the XOR is a particular value small y, given I give you everything to this point, including these internal outputs. Okay? So it just makes the problem easier to reason about because how this distribution looks like is much easier to describe if we know these prior separate outputs for pi 1 and pi 2. Again, these are independent permutations. So, okay, so the question now is really let's understand this. Turns out it's not that hard, and I told you that all of the combinatorics will be easy okay, in this thing. So the question really is, let's say we are targeting a particular small y, we are making this query x4 to both. And now what we want to count now is how many possible answers for pi 1, so how many possible u4, or in general ui's, are, are good and can potentially lead to this particular value small y. Okay, given that we know all of the prior outputs of the individual permutations. So now, which ones are you know, good and which ones are bad? 
So now clearly one thing is that we know that this U4 is not going to be equal to, U sorry, because I keep putting my hand on this. So U4 cannot be equal to U1, U2, or U3 because it's a permutation and it's a new query. So this value will not show up. Also, what we also know is that, um, so there are these values that are, um, so if we get, um, so a value which is equal, for example, V1, X, or Y, uh, like that, that's not really a, a good value because, um, first of all, pi 2 is also a permutation. And if we get a value, say U4 is going to be equal to V1, X, or Y, then the only value that pi 2 can return and will give us y is v1. But pi 2 cannot return v1 because uh, pi 2 is also a permutation and v1 was already a prior value. Right? So if the point now, and then there's a particular intersection of values in between that we don't know, which I call diy. But the point is that if I actually return any value from pi 1, which is in this space outside, then uh, there is a chance that there is a corresponding value that pi 2 can return that will lead me to this small y. And so the probability that I get a particular y is exactly the size of this complement of this, you know, the, the size of these two sets. So this area out here, which is exactly obtained here by inclusion exclusion. So it's 2 to the n, so everything, minus the size of these two sets that are i minus 1 large, plus the size of the intersection, which is some variable that I'm leaving open so far. And so whenever I hit one of these value in here, so my ui is in here, then there is a corresponding um, vi that I can choose, also with probability 1 over 2 to the n minus i plus 1, that will make uh, the value, small, the x or small y. So I hope I'm making any sense here, but maybe it's easier to read than to listen to me. But it's really just counting how many values for UI are possible that will have a matching VI that when XORT will give you uh, this value small y. And then we just get uh, a probability here that we, so that's, that's, that's actually the, the hard, the, one of the two hardest parts of the proof. Because if you now plug this in, uh, I mean, the other hard part is some calculations here that are really tedious and I'm hiding from here. But basically, if you plug in this expression that I had before in these prior slides with everything we've seen before, linearity of expectation and so on, what you get, you get a rather funky expression as an upper bound of the distinguishing advantage. So I basically use everything so far, chi-square, everything, and this final formula we can get an upper bound on the distinguishing advantage, which is 2 over 2 to the 3n, sum over all queries from 1 to q, sum over all possible output, of the variance of this quantity diy. What, what was diy? Diy was the size of the intersection of these two sets uh, that uh, we had found. And so, Again, so it turns out, so what are we really asking here, right? So if you trust this, in, this inequality, is that we have this scenario where we sample u1 to ui minus 1. These are outputs of a permutation, so they are random string without replacement. And then we are sampling this v1 x or y to vi minus x or y, where v1, vi minus 1 are also permutations outputs. They are uniform without replacement. And in fact, you can think about the fact that uh, this x or y doesn't really change the distribution. So you could equivalently think of them as just sampling i minus 1 values v1 to vi minus 1 without replacement, forget about y. And then we want to look at what's the size of the intersection of this set. That's what this di is. It's a random variable, it's well defined, and we care about its variance. And this is an exercise in probability. We are running out of time, but you just get that this variance is i minus 1 square over 2 to the n at most. It's an easy calculation, actually. So it's a very standard, non standard, but not hard question. So you sample this random string without replacement, two sets of size i minus 1, check what's the intersection. 
It's a well-defined random variable, compute its variance. Once you have that, plug it into the formula, and you get the bound you wanted. Right. So it's really not hard combinatorics. There's a lot of work I'm hiding, but it's all pretty standard. And uh, it's totally it's like three pages, right? Uh, and what you get here is this q to the third over two to the 3n, which again, you can simplify. And uh, you get exactly, so q over two to the n to the 1.5, which is this bound. And you don't have to do all of these very hard combinatorics that other proofs have been doing. So are there any questions? I mean, we are basically done. Um, just want to point out that there is also a general version of this theorem where you can just look at multiple uh, permutations and you can use standard techniques to show that the advantage becomes even smaller if you took more permutations. Uh, but I really don't know if what we can prove now is tight with respect to the decay with the number of permutations. So this is sort of a bit open. Okay, so just in conclusion, I, I want to point out that, again, one of the main lessons is that there's really no one size fits all method to solve all of these problems. There are also other methods that I haven't discussed that, that have been used, uh, that use different tools. I mean, there, there's a few popular ones over the last few years. For example, another thing that has come up in several settings for studying construction is to just use tools from Markov chains. Um, so basically, you think of your evaluation of a construction on so a bunch of query x1 to xq for an iterated construction as a chain that maps value to the outputs and then use standard methods or new methods from Markov chain theory to try to analyze things. It's been done, especially in the context of formal preserving encryption. There's some very nice work by Rogaway and co-authors that do that. And also in, in a lot of works in what is called indifferentiability that you might have encountered, uh, we sort of use uh, very different methods to prove indistinguishability that are very like painful at the level of mapping randomness between experiments in order to be very precise. And I won't go into that either. And I'm sure there are more that I'm not discussing here. But just to tell you, there's much more than what I talked about. But still, what I presented you is a good overview of techniques that have helped us solve a bunch of problems over the last few years. And um, so yeah, one thing I wanted to tell you, that's what we mentioned already before. I think some of the open questions in this space are actually very exciting if you are into combinatorics. So everything which is about reducing independence in key alternating ciphers, for example, which could be exactly making sure that the permutations are, uh, are dependent and they're not independent. The other thing is about the keys. I mean, in reality, we're not gonna have independent keys like in the analysis. We really rely on the independence. Uh, you could start asking questions, what if they're correlated? What if they're generated through some clever key schedule, like in an actual block cipher? What kind of results can you actually prove? And all of these are actually very nice questions. Some of them have meaningful answers that we can expect to prove potentially. So they are not clearly out of reach, uh, but uh, the techniques are completely open. And some of them connect to very nice combinatorics questions. So for example, this question with three rounds, it's only when we know things with uh, repeating keys or repeating permutation, they really connect to a series of tools from additive combinatorics that in turn rely on Fourier analysis for the proofs, and which are actually, uh, it's a very beautiful uh, set of tools. All right, thank you. I'll end here. I know this was a bit harder than yesterday, but hopefully you get a sense about where the field is going here. Okay, thank you. Um, can you just describe what's the, what does the sum capture theorem give you? I think mirror theory, for example, gives you a, an upper bound on the number of solutions to some Right, so... A system of equations, like the sum capture theorem? Yeah, so, I mean, it depends on which level you are going to abstract it out, right? But, um, yeah, so th there's different... So let me think what's the best um, way to look at it, actually. Yeah, so, I mean, okay, so I think one thing that we, we really use a lot in the analysis of, um, so actually maybe the best thing I was answering before when I, when I asked the question was like, oh, is the analysis remain the same? And I was actually thinking about the specific problem when uh, we have the same permutation and independent keys. So I think a much more uh, insightful example where the sum capture theorem comes in and it's more interesting to think about is if you look at the dual question to that that has been looked, which is the question where you have uh, independent permutation, say pi one, pi two, and then you have uh, a repeating key. 
So you'll use k, k here, right? And, and so if you do um, what, what the analysis here, you could try to do something similar, because now it's really pi 1, pi 2, so you could try to define this graph, pi 1, pi 2, and now you basically have these partial hedges, and now you want to say, okay, what's the probability that I actually get a chain? Right, so what is the probability that, so these are queries to pi 1, pi 2, what's the probability that now my chosen key are going to connect these edges, right? And here in our analysis, we were inherently using independence of the keys for that, right? We're going to just say, well, the probability that, for example, I connect this, this point with this point is exactly 1 over 2 to the n, and then if I have to connect further, I also have 1 over 2 to the n, right? So now the point is that it turns out that if you actually are um, choosing the same keys, you cannot use independence anymore, but it's also not immediately clear that the bound that you're going to get is significantly worse, although you're not using independence. And, and so, so some capture theorem, again, at the most general level, they allow you to look at the relations that these keys will need to satisfy, given some queries you make to the permutations, and then to count how many solutions there actually are over high, with high probability over the queries that you make to the permutation, and to make conclusions that give you bounds that are similar to what you would expect if you were actually using independent keys. I mean, I can give you also formal statements, but there's a bunch of different formal statements that are ad hoc to what you're trying to do, but that's what you're trying to solve. Right, so, so you need to really look more into the structure and realize that, you know, because you're making queries to the permutation, you know, things might lay, be laid out in a particular way with good probability that will only, uh, you know, allow a smaller fraction of the key that you might expect to satisfy this. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so on your motivation slide where you presented like uh, a sequence of results in yeah. trying to prove the security of XOR. Yeah. Uh, I believe uh, you also <coughs> uh, presented your results, uh, the current techniques uh, under the umbrella of mirror theory. Yeah. So uh, what exactly is mirror theory? Like could you give some high level um, description of it or? Yeah, so what is mirror theory? I mean, uh, okay, this is like one, of, it's very, very like meta question. So you will have to ask you know, Jacques Paterin, exactly what he meant by it because he means something more general. But, but basically what is happening at the level of this construction, uh, so really what we are trying to do is the following, right? So what, what is the ground problem that we are trying to solve? If we, so let's say we want to really attack this problem of analyzing XOR in the most like straightforward way possible, right? So I want to say compute actual interpolation probabilities and then use something like H coefficient, right? So how do we compute the interpolation probability for this construction of XOR in two permutations, right? So the question that we are really doing, we're really trying to solve is the following, is that you have some potential output of Y1 to YQ, and then really what basically you're doing is you're trying to say, let's look at the, out, the underlying outputs of the permutation. So I have, uh, you know, U1 to UQ, V1 to VQ, and I'm trying to count how many potential outputs these permutations can have that satisfy the property that if I XOR them together, I'm going to hit this target Y1 to YQ. So basically, right, so what you get is you get a system of equation with respect to XOR, right, that you're trying to solve, but where these sort of random, these, these values that you are adding together, they have the property that they're all distinct across the U's and they're all distinct across the V's. And there's also a, a version with the one key construction and um, so this XOR versus XOR2 where basically all of them are distinct because they all come from the same permutation, right? So you ca you're counting the number of solutions to this equation. So I give you an arbitrary Y1 to YQ. How many Y1 to YQ and V1 to YQs are there such that their pairwise XORs are equal to Y1 to YQ and the U's are indistinct and the V are distinct, right? So it's a very, you know, elegant question by itself and it's a counting question, right? It just turns out that counting this is extremely involved. Right? But if you could do that, then what these proofs really do is they get automatically a very nice expression for the interpolation probability. And as far as I remember, there are not even bad transcripts. So it's really like straightforward, like the first proof I gave you of the switching lemma. Right? So now for every y1 to yq, you get the fraction of solutions that is going to give you that. Then you just divide by, to get a probability, and you're done. And that's how you get these tight bounds. But what is really hard is actual counting. Whereas in our case, we do get around that completely by, 
using a different metric. And I think the interesting question here is that, so up to very recently, so this work I presented is actually older. And um, we at least had the feeling that through chi-square we were getting an even better bound because of the higher exponent. Now this, this, this recent work by Nandi and co-authors shows that you can potentially get an even better bound through mirror theory by doing things carefully. But I don't know if it's really necessary. So I, I kind of have the intuitive feeling, even though I never managed to make it work, and some others have tried, that you might be able to just use a different uh, information theoretic metric or maybe a slightly different angle and then hope that you can get better bounds directly without going through mirror theory. So it's a good question. But, but to answer, that's a long answer to your question. Really what's mirror theory about is really about counting solutions to this type of equations.